Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Eileen Fisher, and I'm the Associate Dean Research and the Anne and Max Tannenbaum Chair of Entrepreneurship and Family Enterprise here at Schulich. And I'm delighted to be the Master of Ceremonies for this evening's Dean's Leadership Dialogue session. To begin uh, this evening's session, I'm now going to read the Indigenous Nations Land Acknowledgement, which is officially proclaimed at the beginning of all York University events. At this event, as this event is also virtual and we are not all gathered in the same space, I recognize that this land acknowledgement might not be for the territory that you are currently on. We ask that if that's the case, you take the responsibility to acknowledge the traditional territory you are on and the current treaty holders. As a member of the York University community, I recognize that many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. York University acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations. The area known as Takaranto has been in the care of the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat. It is now home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Métis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. Before I introduce our two guests, I would like to quickly mention an important technical matter. Following the discussion, we will take questions from our in-person and virtual audience. We invite you to submit your questions through menti.com, por the portal. Uh, you can simply log on to the platform at menti.com, input the code 29434176, and submit your questions. And now, it is my great pleasure to introduce you to this evening's special guest and our featured speaker, Kathleen Taylor. Katie is the chair of RBC, the first woman ever to become chair of a major Canadian bank. She is also the former CEO of York for, of Four Seasons Hotels and Resorts and the newly appointed Chancellor of York University. And of course, she is a proud Schulich MBA, JD, uh, graduate from the class of 84 and a member of the Dean's Global Council of Advisors. We are delighted she could join us today. I am also pleased to introduce Detlev Vick. Dean of the Schulich School of Business, and the Tana H. Schulich Chair in Digital Marketing Strategy. Welcome, Dean Zvick. So with that, I will turn the floor over to Dean Zvick and Katie Taylor to begin this evening's conversation. Thank you. Very good. Uh, microphone's on. Okay. Yep. Great. Well, thanks, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Katie Taylor. You're here tonight as a star executive, uh, one of the school's most accomplished alumni, a, uh, a, an alumni that we are very proud of as a school as well, but that's who you are now. So let's start with giving the audience a little bit of a sense uh, of who Katie Taylor is, your journey, your life journey in a way from uh, you know, from wherever you came from, <laughs> and it's a very interesting story, to becoming uh, one of Canada's uh, most impressive and trailblazing executives. Well, let me first just say thank you so much for inviting me uh, and, uh, and for the warm introduction uh, from both of you. That was very, very, very nice. And thanks all of you for being with us both uh, here in person and, and, uh, and online for, uh, for tonight's dialogue. Um, <clears throat> As, uh, as you mentioned, where did I come from? Um, it's, uh, it's always a, a, a little bit of a great story. I was born in Toronto, um, moved, to, uh, moved to Oshawa before Oshawa was the Oshawa that you know it um, to be today and grew up there as a, uh, as a young girl in very modest, uh, modest beginnings. Um, came back to Toronto in, uh, in, to do undergraduate and uh, literally had virtually you know, my aspiration was to get a university degree. Um, I was a good student. I understood education was going to be transformative to my life, but I, my aspirations were quite limited. And uh, I grew up in Oshawa, as I said, um, there in those days, this is the 60s and, and early 70s. 
Um, women usually did one of five things. They were homemakers like my mother or they were a teacher, um, many of whom I, I knew well. Sometimes they were an administrative assistant, sometimes they were a nurse, um, and sometimes they were nuns. Um, but that was the full repertoire of women that, uh, that were visible to me as a, young, uh, as a young woman growing up. When I got to uh, Toronto to do undergrad, I realized, holy smokes, women can do all kinds of other things. I was enrolled in English and history because my dream was to become a teacher. Um, I quickly switched to political science and economics. My dream didn't vary too much um, in the early days. I thought maybe I grew up to be a professor, um, and that would be uh, that would be better even than teaching uh, teaching high school. But it was from there that I went on to uh, uh, think about school as and and additional learning and and applied and was accepted to the joint program here. Uh, it was the first uh, law uh, business program of its kind in Canada at the time. Um, a very small cohort, only seven of us in, in my class. Um, and it's fair to say that that was, uh, that was also a, a, a journey that was very transformative for me. Um, ended up practicing law for a little while um, and in corporate securities department. I wasn't a natural born lawyer. I uh, cycled through a bunch of the different law departments. I was at Goodman's um, in downtown Toronto, uh, still one of Canada's foremost law firms. But it wasn't it wasn't meant to be my career, um, and uh, and ultimately I was recruited from there to go to Four Seasons and uh, and uh, started there as the number two in the two person law department. So it wasn't terribly glamorous, uh, but it was going to be a fun job um, helping the company. Uh, develop and build hotels all around the world. Spent 24 years there, grew up through the business side of the business, became a co-president in 99, became um, uh, the chief operating officer in, in 2007, and then the CEO in, in 2010. Um, and uh, after I finished up that, moved on to what I do now, my portfolio life, um, which has been uh, very interesting, and you've touched on some of that as well. So uh, so I think the message in all of that is is probably just... Education, education, education. Um, I was the first person in my family uh, to go to university. Um, proud to say that uh, the next generation, whether they be my children, my daughter's here tonight with my husband, they'll keep me honest on some of the answers I'll give you. Um, <laughs> uh, my daughter, my nieces, nephews, our other children, everybody um, went on to university to earn uh, at least their, their undergraduate degree, and most of them have gone on also to, to graduate school. So it's a, it's a, it's a, a journey that uh, I've continued to encourage in the next generation of our family. Wonderful. And of course, today also Katie Taylor is synonymous with, with this, this notion of breaking the glass ceiling. I'm, I'm not sure it's the perfect metaphor, it sounds almost like you break it and now the floodgates open and women stream in. That's not really exactly how it, uh, how it works. Um, but nonetheless, you, you've, you found yourself in spaces that perhaps you weren't necessarily expected to be in mm -hmm. uh, as the first woman in, in, those, in those spaces. And, and you didn't just do this once, you did it three times, different industries, different sectors. So how we we're able to, to get into these spaces in, in a really practical sense, how did Katie Taylor get there? I think it's a question a lot of us are kind of wondering about. Well, it's interesting. Part, part of it is timing. Um, born in 57, so became a female executive um, in the, uh, the mid-80s. Um, at a time when women weren't um, very, very visible. There were very few women in, in, um, in the capital market space. On the law side then, there were virtually no women in positions of leadership um, on the, uh, in the hotel space. Very, very undiverse. Um, and, uh, and of course, you, know, you mentioned some other firsts that, that have gone on in my portfolio life. Part of it was timing. Part of it was I didn't really spend very much time worrying about the fact that I was a girl. Um, it, it just wasn't relevant to the kinds of things that I had to grapple with all the time. I mean, it became more relevant later, later in my life when I started to see the impact of being the first woman to do different things. And as I always say, I'm happy to be the first. I've been the first at, at so many things, um, uh, largely because of age and stage and the path that my career took. But my pledge always was, okay, I'm happy to be the first, but I will not be the last. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, to your point about the breaking of the glass ceiling, I always warn that, uh, yes, you can break the glass ceiling, but beware the replacers of the glass. 
um, because they are out there in full force. And, uh, and if we're not really, really diligent about our commitment to, uh, to gender and non-gender diversity and inclusion, um, we can lose ground. Um, and uh, so it's a constant um, uh, way of thinking about it. And I also think that, that for people who, who have the privilege of doing something first, it's really important to accept your role model um, impact. You know, if people can see something, they can do it or they think they can do it, they can aspire to do it. I always tell, like to repeat the story of the, of the first four minute mile. It was believed that no one could run a four minute mile. And then Roger Bannister did it. And within a very short period of time, like a number of days, another person did it. And then within a few months, dozens of people had done it. So the notion of being able to see something mm -hmm and role model after it, and then go after it yourself in, the, in your own personal version of what it is. I think that's a, something that, that I've taken away from this, and, and hopefully it, it starts to help others. Mm -hmm. And are there, so you know, you, you already mentioned this, this notion of uh, beware the replacers of the glass ceiling or other forms of barriers, hurdles, structures that, that can go get in the way, reverse some of, some of the progress made. Um, what are some of the concrete things you think we can do, and perhaps we also as a, as a business school, to keep moving the needle uh, and enable more women to get into the spaces, into the C-suites, into the boardrooms, um, uh, to, keep, to keep the momentum going uh, that you have created? Well, I would say first and foremost, um, uh, I'm a big proponent of targets and, and, uh, and people setting targets for the kind of gender and non-gender diversity they aspire to in their organizations, in their institutions, in the work that they do. And, and by no means am I talking about quotas. I'm talking about targets. We set sales targets in our business. We have customer retention targets. We have turnover targets for our employees. We have uh, earnings targets. We have targets for everything in business. We have so many KPIs, sometimes it's hard to keep track of all of them. Uh, but most businesses will, will first and foremost say, well, our people are our most important asset. If that's true, um, then you should be measuring all those same things about your human, uh, your human capital the same way you're doing it with your financial capital. And so setting aspirational targets, where would you like to be on gender and non-gender diversity in two years, in five years, in 10 years? These are, these are big projects, they're not easy fixes. Um, there's no, there's no. Oh well, I'll just go and get some people and and make my uh, make my diversity uh, my diversity numbers look better. This is all about creating a sustainable model uh, where women and and people of color and indigenous fo uh, peoples and everyone feels like they've got the same opportunity, equal opportunity, as uh, as everyone else. Um, but that takes work. So first, I would say. It's setting yourself some aspirational goals and measuring yourself against them. Not achieving them, sometimes we miss our earnings targets in business, don't we? What do we do? We don't give up. We retreat, we regroup, we examine, we make a new plan and we go forward. And I would say the same thing needs to be true on, ca on, on, on the human capital component. The second thing I would say is you've got to put the processes in place that will support this kind mm -hmm. of an approach. Um, and that's hiring, that's promotion, that's development, that's mentorship, that's sponsorship, that's extracurricular and, and in-house uh, in training and, and cross-functional experiences and being very, very mindful of the career tracks that we, we give to women. There's recent research out um, uh, this last month that shows that women who are um, literally provided opportunities to stay in operational roles, roles with, with profit and loss impact uh, for a good chunk of their career are more likely to advance to the C-suite. So being very, very mindful about the kinds of roles and the kinds of jobs and the kinds of development that we make available to our diverse, uh, our diverse groups, mm -hmm. super important as well. Okay. I mean, you look at the numbers sort of corporate Canada of course, a lot of progress has been made over the last 20 years. In some industries, we see now up to almost 40%, let's say, mm -hmm. just when it comes to gender diversity in, in the boardroom. 
But there are other industries and ones that you are very familiar with, uh, either because of your previous work or what you, the work you're doing right now, uh, private equity, venture capital, technology, where we still see sectors that are heavily male dominated, mm -hmm. where stories about sexism in the workplace are uh, abound. And uh, I think where we still see uh, a significance of lag in, uh, in, in, in diversity uh, and, and workplace culture. How do we, nonetheless, we have students uh, right now, probably in a room or uh, online, uh, female students as well that aspire to, to enter these industries. Mm -hmm. we, we would love to have the, those uh, places um, without any hurdles such as sexism in place. It's not the reality at the moment. How do we prepare those students for, for a world of work where you encounter sexism? Well, it's it's uh, it's not. There's no easy answer to it. Um, I think that it's uh, it's it's the world hasn't completely changed yet. We we do need it to change generationally. But until until that occurs in all of the the places we'd like it to occur, then I then I do think there is a a, a place whether it's in curriculum or it's in extracurricular training or it's in mentorship. Um, I spend a lot of my free time uh, mentoring young men and young women about navigating um, workplace barriers and workplace challenges. Um, it's fair to say that uh, you know, everybody finds their situation differently, but, but I would say focusing, uh, focusing in here on, on, on women navigating the workplace, it, it is a particularly um, different setting than academia, right? We, we come out of our, our, our undergrad or our graduate work or whatever it is, prepared to take the world on. Um, we've been the A++ student, our, we've got a 4.0 GPA, and, and boy, oh boy, we're ready to win. Um, and one of the things you realize when you get out in, in the real world, as I, I'll call it for the sake of this argument, is that the best paper doesn't always win. And the highest marks don't always matter. There's so many other variables in, in, the, uh, in the workplace, in a, in a business setting, in a sectoral setting, that, that we, need to take, uh, we need to take into account. And, and sometimes we can have this notion that, oh, because there are oh, so many other factors other than just the best marks, that the system is unfair. Um, the system might be unfair, but like it or not, the system is the system. And so at, the, at, the, at its core, what we need to do is, is teach our young people how to navigate that, how to work with it, how to take advantage of it, how to, how to duck the, the, uh, the arrows if they come, if they come our way, um, and, uh, and, how to, and how to get um, really confident and capable in this uh, kind of unclear um, and sometimes opaque work environment. Um, there's no question that, uh, that you know, Things like sexual harassment and, and, and even sexual assault, as we're reading about in the, in the paper, continue to happen. Um, and, uh, and that's a big problem. Uh, but um, when it happens, um, we also need, as, as, as young women, to have a toolkit on, okay, what do we do with that? How do we cope? What's, what's, the, what's the way to go about that? Um, in order for that not to be a derailer for us, that not to be something that continues to, to impact our careers and, in, and, and, and we get ourselves to a place of safety with the help of, of colleagues and others um, in, uh, in our offices. And uh, I remember when I was a, uh, a very young lawyer, I was left in alone in a boardroom with a, a man who was uh, reasonably unsavory. Um, and, uh, and it was a very uncomfortable moment. Um, I managed to get myself out of there, uh, but the answer was, okay, what do I do now? Very powerful client. So I went straight to the senior partner and said, this just happened. Um, now, this was many, many decades ago. He, they didn't fire the client, and they didn't, you know, call the police and, and do all the things that I might have, have thought to do today. Um, but, uh, but what they did do was say, okay, she can never be alone with that person again. So... You fellows, because there were fellows in my department, whenever she has to go and he's in the meeting, one of you goes with her. Never alone again. And mm -hmm. that actually made me feel 
completely safe, mm -hmm. totally confident that they had my back. And I was able to finish the, we were working on a takeover at the time. I was able to finish the deal very successfully, got it all signed up and never had to deal with that, uh, that person again. Mm -hmm. um, that's not the recipe um, that I might advocate in the modern moment. Uh, but many decades ago, it was the best that was available to me. But, but just understanding that there is help and there is support and there is backing and there are places to, to, to go, mm -hmm. something that we, we really don't talk about as much as we should perhaps in advance, mm -hmm. and then, then we end up having to talk about it after, after something has occurred that might have been avoidable. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's a fair point. Are we talking enough about those kind of real world moments that, sim that are simply quite common, I think, in some, uh, unfortunately, in some sectors and some industries today. How do we prepare students? And we, it's something I think we need to take back as a business school, maybe bring it into the classroom. Where can we have actually these discussions with our students to, to walk through some of the scenarios and, and actually change, uh, probably build resilience, build responses, but also help perhaps our male students understand, of course. you know, what what is actually happening in these workplaces and, and totally. work against it, be allies, right? The solution doesn't happen without without our right. without our male colleagues, and it isn't only women who who are right. subjected to these uh, yep. to these yeah. sorts of uh, these sorts of issues. So it really is a really is a community problem, um, yeah. one that we have to we all have to take on and, and figure out how to help one another um, when mm -hmm. uh, when these unfortunate incidents do arise. So just shifting gears for a second, uh, an important concept uh, that often is brought, brought up in a conversation, especially with a, a, a superstar female executive. <laughs> it's interesting, because when I was thinking about this question, would I ask the same question around, about work-life balance if, I was, if my guest was a, a male executive? Maybe not. Would the audience even perceive it as a gap in the conversation? Perhaps not. And it, it started helping me reflect a little bit about the assumptions we are bringing to the conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, so here we are, nonetheless, um, it, and it is something you have thought about a lot, you have commented on. Uh, it's an important issue, I think it's a real issue for, uh, especially I think also our female students aspiring to uh, exciting careers, mm -hmm. uh, applying their talents to aspire to leadership positions, think, also thinking about, okay, how am I gonna do that and navigate the other domain, which is sort of family, if that's what uh, what the plans are, mm -hmm. um, and, and so on. Uh, what's, what is your take? And, and an interesting quote to start off, off with that I noticed uh, as a reaction to this work-life balance that you once said is the following. Everyone has to come to grips with the fact that there is no work-life balance. So very, very clear statement on this. Unpack that for us. What sure. exactly do you mean? So, so I kind of mean exactly what I said, which is that, uh, that, that there, there really isn't this notion of balance um, when you are aspiring to a exciting career, yet you want also to have uh, a family, um, a partner, build a, a community of life around yourself, whatever, whatever that might look like. Um, so, so, you know, there used to be uh, the expression when I was, uh, when I was, you know, coming out of graduate school, it was, oh, women can have it all. Well, the answer is no. N no one actually can have it all. But we, each of us can have our own all. And that will hopefully get us to a place where we achieve what I like to call work-life integration. Um, I think that's the best can be hoped for. Um, where you figure out the kind of career that you'd like to have, you figure out the kind of personal life you'd like to have, and then you put the puzzle pieces together in a way that are logical and planful and thoughtful, but agile and adaptable. Um, and I often use the phrase daily conscious choices to, uh, to illustrate this point, um, because your life changes over and over and over again. You have uh, this, this divide that you started out by saying, well, we have the same conversation with men and women. We will never have the same conversation with men and women because women are the ones that have to have the babies. And so by definition, um, there is this inalterable difference between the experience of a, of a man and the experience of a woman. Um, and there, we're not going to be able to change that biologically. So what we need to try to figure out how to do 
is to allow women to, yes, if they would like to have children, to, to make that a part of their reality, but also um, help them find ways to do that in, 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 on journeys that don't also then in turn have to upset their career aspirations. Um, the two can go together, again, if, if, if we're very careful about how we work on integration. And this goes, takes me back to daily conscious choices. You wake up every day, something's changed. Um, the agility, the resiliency that has to go into, all right, what changed? Today what changed? My mom got sick. Um, and now all of a sudden, as a, a daughter, I've got to adapt to the fact that I have a mother who's going to need more of my time. Well, what does that mean? It's 24 hours in every day. No matter how you, well you, go, you negotiate, that's not going to change. Something's got to give. So, so every day, does something need to change here? Is anything changed here? Your boss will come to you one day and say, you know what, Susan, we're going to give you a big promotion. It's going to be really exciting. And uh, Izzy Sharp years ago, who was my longtime boss and champion at Four Seasons, once gave me some very good advice, which is, he was the one who said, there's 24 hours in the day, and you, even you, great negotiator that you are, can't negotiate your way out of that. The other thing he said to me was, when you get a promotion, everybody in your life gets a promotion. So you need to go home, just because you're happy about the job, you also need to go home and ask your partner, are you happy with me taking on more? It's going to mean more days on the road, it's going to mean more, more time at the office, it's going to mean more stress, it's going to be more weekend calls. You okay with that? Because you just got a promotion. You've got more work to do um, than you had before. You have to talk to your children. Mom's getting a promotion. You guys are going to see less of me. I'm going to be there for even fewer basketball and volleyball games, Kev, than I was in, the, in, the, in your days growing up. You kids, okay, can you adjust to that? You're getting a promotion. Your housekeeper's getting a promotion. Your caregiver's getting a promotion. Your administrative assistant. Everybody has to take on more when you take on more. And this goes back to these daily conscious choices. So now you've taken on more. What can you stop doing? What do you need to, to get more help with? What do you need to outsource? Because you, uh, you, can't, uh, you can't be in charge of everything. And, uh, and, and women, we tend to like to be um, all things to all people. It's, it's, a, it's not, not surprising. It's, you know, part of, part of the DNA of how mankind became the most successful surviving species on the planet. Um, but we need to understand, I think, often the, the limitations of that 24 hours and many priorities and, and just the way we do with work. What's the most important thing today? What can wait? What shouldn't be I be focused on anymore. I have a young woman that I mentor and she was um, not really happy with the idea of having a, a big career meant that she was going to have to get more help with the children. And I said, well, you know, leave the kids out of it. What else can you get more help with? And, uh, and we, we talked about something as silly as laundry. And uh, she and her husband just were really against having any help in, in their home, even though she'd gone back to Bay Street to try to have a big a big career in capital markets. And I said, well, you kind of have to start to ask yourself, what is it you're really good at? You know, how much value do you add to the laundry? Are you doing laundry better than everyone else in the world knows how to do it? Or is that something you could actually ask somebody for help with? And, and we, we, just all of this stuff, it sounds kind of silly, some of my examples, but making room for that life and work integration on the things that matter most, your children, your partner, your career, your colleagues, making room for that and, and, and getting some of the, the other stuff out of the way, mm -hmm. daily conscious choices, and you have to be ready to change them daily. Mm -hmm about conscious choices and let you know that we are at 7.35. Okay. So maybe I, you can figure out your last question for okay. our guest. We'll do then, and it'll be, I'll focus on leadership style because okay. for anyone who's followed your trajectory, your career trajectory uh, over the last uh, 20, 30 uh, years, what comes to mind for many is a unique leadership style. Uh, you were routinely rated by your employees as one of the best CEOs uh, in all of Canada. And you've, you've uh, you, you mentioned once uh, that you have a clipping on your desk, which I find really interesting, uh, and it, it contained the following leadership principle. 
You, you'll know you're a good leader when you look over your shoulder and see if anyone is following you. Uh, so tell us a little bit about your personal leadership style that, that uh, I think has, has been an integral part of what's sh shape, shaping your journey. Yeah. So, so followership, servant leadership, whatever you'd like to call it in the, in the textbook sense, um, is definitely the style of leadership that I was um, groomed in. Um, for 24 years at Four Seasons Hotels and Resorts. Um, for those of you who've never worked in the hotel business, um, you might not know all the ins and outs of what happens in, in the making of that cake, uh, but you've all been guests in a restaurant or in a hotel at one point or another in your lives. And, and so what you <clears throat> probably could take away from that is that there's absolutely nothing that occurs at the moment of product delivery in those environments that the CEO has any control over. Nothing. He or she can, maybe if they want to, say, okay, on Tuesdays we're going to have a steak special and on Thursdays we're going to have fish, fish special. But the actual experience that you get in a hotel or in a restaurant or in any kind of other hospitality environment is delivered. The product is delivered the moment you come into contact with the other human being who is serving you. And so by definition, it's a highly decentralized, highly empowered um, kind of culture that's required to make that experience and that product great. And so if you start with the fact that the employee is, ev the frontline employee in that business is everything, and then you keep moving back from it, you soon get to the point where you realize that the CEO is kind of irrelevant to the day in and day out of what happens in that business. And so my job as I grew, I, I learned as I grew up through the ranks in Four Seasons was less about being in charge of anything and controlling anything and directing anything other than big things like, you know, strategic direction and, and which project we would choose in a particular city. But the product piece of it um, was, was something that had to be empowered. And so I had to empower my global presidents. They, in turn, had to empower their regional vice presidents, who, in turn, had all the way down the line, so that the actual product delivery each and every time was inspired and, and consistent and focused on the customer. And so all, you, all I uh, learned by that is that I could do lots of things to set direction, to set tone, to set culture. Um, to set empowerment, um, but actual product delivery, I had to have blind faith in the people who worked with me and, and for me um, in order for them to know that they had the enabling, um, the enabling function and the, and the power to get done what needed to be done for, for employees. And so I would say my, my leadership style was very much informed mm -hmm by the kind of business that I was asked to, asked to run. Mm -hmm. um, and to this day, I still believe that you get the best things done in life, whether you're a CEO or a, uh, a board chair or, or, a, or, or a volunteer or a mentor, you get the best things done when you actually give people the power to fulfill um, their, uh, their dreams and give them the space and the encouragement mm -hmm. to to go out and, and get things done. So big, big cheerleader. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Great, thank you so much. Unfortunately, uh, I cannot continue with no, my line cannot. of questions. And uh, so I will pass it over to Eileen. Thank you very much. I'm gonna start right in with a question that I think uh, is a wonderful question. How do you convey to your subordinates the significance of business ethics and where do you place it re relative to shareholder profit? So, so this is something that, that I call in business life sort of culture and conduct issues, right? This is beha behavioral pieces, how you want people to behave um, in their interactions with your customers, how do you want them to behave in their interactions with one another, how do you want them to behave when no one is looking, when no one is watching? Um, and, you know, so empowering people to, uh, to know what the right thing to do is, and, and to know what the right way of doing that is. A lot of this is, is about culture, but a lot of it is about, uh, about building that common understanding of what you're trying to, uh, 
what you're trying to achieve. Um, it is an extremely important part of stakeholder management, um, and we're, we're all living uh, real time with this debate that, that is raging about whether or not uh, shareholder primacy or stakeholder primacy is, is, is what will prevail. But in virtually every business that I've ever been, been part of, either directly or as a, a, a corporate director or a steward or an advisor, um, it's not as simple as, oh, it's just about the shareholder and it's just about making money. Because if you have a group of employees who are not behaving with integrity, well, they might make quite a lot of money for a little while. Um, but that's going to come to a crashing halt at some point, and it's going to end extremely badly. If you have a group of people who are not treating customers well, that's going to end really badly, really fast, um, because the, the customer defections will be there. If you're, if you're a company that, uh, that serves a community of, of people, um, and you can think about all kinds of of businesses in Canada that, that serve communities, all of our big, uh, our big companies um, would do that. They have a, a real responsibility in, in taking care of um, those businesses for the benefit of um, the citizens of the country. Um, and whether you call that a social license or, or, or a corporate responsibility, it doesn't really matter, but if you get it wrong, um, whether that's uh, you know cell phone systems that go down uh, for days at a time, or 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 airports and airlines that aren't working properly, or hospital emergency rooms today that uh, that we're reading about and hearing about on the news all the time, when when those sorts of things start to not work in communities, then corporations and organizations pay the price for that both directly and, and indirectly through reputation. So, so the notion that, that anybody is immune from, from, from all of those external uh, impacts, I, I, I usually find um, is, uh, is either not true or is, is in a frame that is so short-sighted um, that you would worry about, uh, about, about that long-term. And, and, and at the core of that is the culture of, of the people, of the business, who know what the right thing to do is and know what the right thing, the right way to do that is, and then get on with the business of doing it. If I, if I can just follow up, one of, one of the parts that I think is inclu uh, included increasingly um, into the, the ethics debate has, has to do with sustainability. Uh -huh. You have been very outspoken uh, among business leaders, uh, very much pushing for a carbon zero business model and, and, and sort of world um, with, with some, you know, also added uh, comments around how to manage that transition yes. in a way that uh, doesn't dis uh, affect particular communities, uh, especially negatively and so on. But how do you, so, how, you know, how to get an organization to commit ethically to something like that long-term goal when the legislation doesn't require mm -hmm. something like that yet uh, to move that that fast. And again, going back also to the leadership style, right? Mm -hmm. Getting getting organization to follow. How do you how do you think about uh, making in some ways an ethical question a, a central one? Mm -hmm. So I think it 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 uh, it's a very important question, and companies um, all, all over the place are grappling with this today. Uh, I think the uh, the net zero commitment is one that uh, you know, society is pushing us towards. We, we really need to do something to try to arrest um, the, uh, the, the further ravages of, uh, of climate change. Um, we know exactly what the science tells us about how long we've got. Um, we know what the commitment is, net zero 2050. Um, now the debate is about how to get there. Uh, and, uh, and yes, I think that, that there's a few things. Um, progress has to be steady and meaningful. Some of the solutions to our problems don't even exist today. But we know we have the science and the technology and the, and the, and the engineering know-how to, to get some of that work done. Some of the solutions are right there in front of us. Um, and I think from, from corporations' perspective, you know, our corporations exist on many continuums. We have, you know, let's pick airlines at what one end of the spectrum that are, are, are big carbon emitters. Um, 
financial services businesses at the other end are very, very low emitters, um, but are, are financing um, people who are, who are high emitters. And so trying to get, get everybody focused on what their role is in the transition to net zero, um, get them focused on their own targets, whether that's their own operations, their clients' operations, upstream, downstream, all of that. Um, trying to get your arms around that, come together with common, common methods for measuring that, common understanding of, of how we're going to work on that. Um, but I think it goes back to it goes back to what I said before about about targets. You know, we've got we've got this long range target. Now we're going to have to set some some targets that are nearer in. Um, low hanging fruit. Uh, there's lots of it out there that can be uh, that companies can can take advantage of quickly. Other parts of it are going to take mm -hmm. a lot more work. I, I do think that the the just and orderly piece of this cannot be lost because. A disorderly transition will be very, very costly and very difficult um, for a number of, of groups. An orderly transition is going to require a monstrous amount of coordination uh, between organizations, between organizations and governments, between governments, between countries. Um, this is a global problem. Uh, even if we solved all of our carbon emissions in Canada, that wouldn't help very much because we are such a small part of the uh, of the overall. So we've really got to make this a, a both a national as well as a global uh, coordinated effort, and and uh, no uh, no end of complication in that very uh, very short statement. Okay, appreciate it. Uh, remote work. I uh -huh. had a number of questions. Uh, just to put a few of them together. Um, do you see it continuing? Do you think it should continue? What are your thoughts about remote work? And any specific things to RBC would be, you know, sure. welcome. Well, remote work is, is obviously very popular. We're reading about this in the, in the news all the time. I have my own uh, focus group um, uh, in the family who, who gives me uh, lots of feedback on the value of flexibility in, in work. And, uh, and there's no question that we figured out something during the pandemic that we never knew before, which is that we actually can carry on um, without being together. We can carry on. One of the questions going forward will be, um, you know, how to make that whole situation optimal. There are thousands, millions of jobs in this country that cannot be done at all remote. You would not want your brain surgeon operating on you remotely. This would be something that would be quite disturbing to you and your family if that was a proposition that was made to you. Um, having said that, there are lots of jobs that are easily done remotely um, and, and have been, by the way, been done remotely for a very long time. Think about call centers. Um, uh, whether, th whether people actually sat in an office or not was kind of immaterial to the fact that they were nowhere near you when you dialed the phone. Um, and so, so there's a continuum of work, I think, that, that, that companies have to and employees have to look at and say, okay, how, how well suited is this particular role, this particular company to a work from anywhere model or a work from home model or a hybrid model? Um, I think there's the, uh, the other element of it is, is, you know, if your company is mostly um, participating in what I call the exposed economy, i.e. the vast majority of your employees have to go out to work every day to earn a paycheck, then you need to ask yourself, all right, well, how does it, how does it work then that a, a, um, a privileged few um, can make a different choice? So what does that do to your culture? How does that, how does that work in, in leadership, in camaraderie? Um, it, uh, there, there's th that to be thought of. Uh, learning an apprenticeship. Um, you know, I, I do think that... Uh, um, as a person who learned the law through apprenticeship as a, as a young person after graduating from law school and then who learned the hotel business literally through apprenticeship, who's learned to be a board member through apprenticeship, in-person apprenticeship. Um, there's a lot in a, in a career that is not possible to, uh, to learn remotely. Um, and so we, I think, have to be very mindful of how, how it fits in the context of what it is you're trying to accomplish in your own career. And I would, I would also <clears throat> say that uh, 
and this is particular back to your, your comment around women and careers for women, flex work existed when I started my career 40 years ago. Um, if flex work this time around turns out to be that flex work, it will not be good. Um, because that flex work, uh, while it was made available to women back then, um, and today we're making it available to everybody, everybody, but back then when it was available to women who wanted to take, uh, take a slower pace, um, maybe because there was children involved, maybe because there was other family responsibilities involved, um, that ended up leaving those women out of leadership positions and being paid less than men. So that experiment cannot be repeated. So whatever it is we get done here, we have to make sure that the mistakes of the past were learned and it doesn't get women off track or, or out of the, that, that slipstream to, uh, to the aspirational C-suite jobs. And so it's got a, a very valuable place, um, this whole notion of flexibility in all of our lives. Everyone loves the idea that tomorrow morning I don't have to get in my car, I don't have to get out of my Lululemons, I can just um, be on screen and get my work done and, and pet my dog over here while I'm, while, I'm, while I'm at it, right? That's fantastic. But we just have to be mindful of the fact that careers are complicated things to manage. Um, and while remote and, and hybrid might be great at some, in some roles for some periods of time, might not be optimal for others. And so just making sure that we're, we're being, again, thoughtful and mindful and, uh, and very, uh, very conscious about what it is we're, we're agreeing to when we, when we take one versus the other or, or, or a combination thereof. Mm -hmm. I'm mindful I've been paying attention to the online audience, but I wonder if there's a question from somebody in the in-person audience, given we're talking about remote and in-person. Is anybody here dying to ask a question? There's lots from online if you don't have one. And maybe w while they're thinking, I, I'd like to really uh, return to a comment you made uh, just in, in your statement around remote work that's, I think, particularly relevant for our students, business students uh, getting you know, MBA degrees, which <laughs> means they will assume managerial positions and then leadership positions and probably will be awarded this flexibility, this potential for this flexibility to work remotely or at least flexibly, but running teams and organizations where, as you were saying, maybe 80% of the workforce has to be actually a present in person. And, and to understand the equity issues as well that come with this when, you know, your, your job, the nature of your job might in fact support flexible work and remote work, is this really what what you should construct your work to be like when the organization uh, and most of most of the, uh, your uh, employees don't have that affordance. Sure. Just something to keep in mind, I think, for our students as well. I think it's a very important point, and I think it, it really goes back to the, the question of what kind of culture are you trying to establish? What kind of organization are you trying to build? What kind of, of leadership do you want to espouse? And if you, if you go back to my followership and servant leadership um, identity, another way I, I often describe that is, you know, never lead on the power of position, only on the power of example. So if you're the boss and you want somebody to behave in a certain way, then you better be behaving in that way. So if you're the boss and you think it's important for the team to be in the office Tuesday to Thursday, well, then you better be in the office and so better your leadership team um, be in the office. If you think it's really important that the corporate office and the manufacturing, if I can take that simple example, has a, has a real symmetry to it, then you better be leading in a way that brings those two groups together, not in a way that, mm. that pulls them apart. And so, so just being mindful of, of all of the complexity of this, this is a great big experiment <laughs> that we've never embarked on. Um, as humankind before, and, and, and some parts of it are going to be brilliant, but there are some pieces of it that I just think we have to be very thoughtful of. Mm -hmm. There's a question mm -hmm. right there. So just thinking about remote work a bit more, for the employee who maybe is facing a policy where they have a choice to come and not, um, and maybe they are, it is more convenient for them to stay home, but they're also maybe a woman or a person of color who's battling with the, uh, the perception that if they don't come in, uh, would you, uh, like, how would you think through that, that, uh, that battle 
Well, I think there's two, two elements to, to this. Could everybody, could everybody hear that, I wonder? So, so the question um, was really around from, from an, with an employee who's been given a choice um, to either work from home or to come in or to do that variably. Um, how to weigh up the, that situation and, and think about those choices and make sure that making the choice in one direction or another doesn't leave you marginalized um, uh, in, 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 your, in your job and in your career prospects. Um, I think there's two sides to that. The first is making sure that your company has a very robust way of thinking about this. And, and, and what do I mean by that? So if you go back to my example of flex work existed 40 years ago and it didn't work at all for women, um, I think today companies, if they want to go down this road of, of sort of flexible do as you will, then, then everything else has to change as well, right? Now you can never, I've always said in business, you can never change just one thing. There's too many knock-on effects. So if you're going to change from everybody in person to everybody variable, um, then all kinds of other things are going to have to change. The way you think about talent development is going to have to change. The way you think about employee interaction is going to have to change. The way you think about culture building is going to change. The way you think about training is going to change. You know, a lot of, a lot of training in business comes from just watching people in the, in the meeting room doing the things they're doing. Um, that doesn't, uh, doesn't come as easily to us in, 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 the, uh, in the remote environment, particularly leadership traits, um, the, way, the way we present, the way we speak, the way we argue if we have a different point of view or, or challenge if we have a different point of view. Um, those sorts of things are, are, are things that, that companies are going to have to really think about developing a new set of skills around. Um, how they measure back to measuring human capital. How we're going to have to put very fine points on these measurements now to make sure that our hybrid employees aren't being treated differently in the overall scheme of salary increases and promotions and and, and opportunities for cross-platform um, uh, influence building. Um, those systems don't exist today because this system didn't exist yet. Um, so that sort of thing. Um, and it's a long list for organizations. I think there is also an onus on us as the, as, the, as the employee, as the leader, as the worker, to think about, okay, since we've made this change, what are my new responsibilities to make sure this is a success for me and for the organization? And so that requires us to be quite mindful of, uh, if, we're, if we're a leader, when we should be showing up. You know, there's nothing worse than being asked to come back to an office three days a week and then getting there and you're the only person mm. in, your, in your line of vision. You might as well be at home, as I said before, working on your computer petting. I have a little, uh, a nice, cute little, little dog that always kind of sits beside me. And, and that's way, much better than sitting in the office all by myself, right? Um, and, and so just figuring out how we as leaders or as, or as team leaders or as employees are going to organize ourselves as a, as a community to make this work for everybody. And if that's fixed days, that's floating, whatever that might be. Um, but I think the other element of it is deciding what kind of career you want to have. And it may be that the kind of career you want to have um, will be a very transactional, um, uh, uh, service-led career that requires very, very little in-person contact with people. In fact, those jobs existed pre-pandemic and they still exist today. Um, but, but if you want to grow up to be the CEO, um, my guess is you can't do that remotely. Um, and, uh, and so being very surgical then about how you choose to spend your time um, at, the, at the office, outside the office, at employee events, organizing other events outside the office. I mean, uh, the, the, uh, it all just doesn't have to focus around the, 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 the cubicles or the office structure, right? There's lots of ways to advance your career and your work aspirations and your ability for mentorship and sponsorship that goes way beyond the walls of, of, any, of any building. So I would say lots of work to, on, to, to be done on the company side, and many of them are taking this on with great... Uh, with, with great um, earnestness because they realize the importance of it. But similarly, I would say a lot of responsibility on you, right? 
Another phrase I like to use is, you, you are the CEO of your career. No matter what stage you're at in life, you're in charge. Nobody else cares more about your career than you do, and nobody else ever will. So by definition, you're going to have to figure out, okay, what's the best way for me to deploy me to the greatest, uh, to the greatest advantage given what my objectives might be? I am so sad to say that we are at 8 o'clock, and I believe we have a hard stop now. I'm getting the nod that that is, in fact, the case. It's been fabulous. It was, and you can't believe how many more questions there are here, as well as in the room, now that we've got people primed. Um, but we have to wrap it up. It has been a great discussion. Um, I want to thank you, Katie Taylor and Dean Zvick, for coming together to provide this great conversation. I want to thank everybody who participated live and online. Uh, we hope that you enjoyed this evening of the, is, this evening's edition of the Dean's Leadership Dialogue. And uh, we're looking forward to seeing you at the next one, which is featuring Bharat Masrani, President and CEO of TD Bank. It'll start at 7 p.m. on November the 2nd here at Schulich and also live streamed. We'll see you there. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. <laughs>